Hashem speaks to Aaron, to Moshe and Aaron, saying, Zos Chukas HaTorah. This is the statute of the Torah. Which Hashem had commanded him to say over, to give over. So Rashi cites the Medrash. What does the Torah have to identify as the ultimate statute? We have many laws in the Torah. Some of the laws are referred to as Mishpatim. Mishpatim means the rational law. Laws which are referred to as Edus, the testaments, events which took place throughout Jewish history. And then we have Chukim, these are statutes. These are laws which on a rational level one can in comprehending the significance of the law. Lefisha Sodan Vumos Ola Monid Es Israel Sotan and the nation of the world they ridicule the Jewish people. Loma Ma Mitzvah Zos. What is this mitzvah? Uma Tam Yeshbo. What is the mit what is its rationale? So two things. First they question what is the mitzvah? And what's its rationale? Seemingly it's redundant. What is the rationale of the mitzvah? The way Rashi cited in Midrash, it's two things. Ma mitzvah zos, what is this mitzvah? Uma tam yishpo. And what's its rationale? Lefichor, so God responds, kosev bo chuka. Chuka, it is a statute. It is the statute. It's the ultimate statute. Zerim lefonai. It's a decree before me. Ein lecho rishus l'arech leo. You're not permitted to question its veracity. It's something which humanly, regardless of the extent of your understanding, it's not comprehensible. It's not possible to understand its inner workings. They ridicule us, Sota, nation of the world. What is this mitzvah? What is its rationale? Hashem's response is, it's beyond human comprehension. As we'll see, discuss in a moment, even Shlomo, the Chochmi Kavodom, the wisest Jew ever lived, which he was able to come upon the understanding of every statute. Although at many levels it's not a rational law, due to his unlimited endowment of wisdom, he was able to delve and understand its inner workings. Paraduma, he says, it's beyond me, it's beyond my comprehension. This is the ultimate statute. What does it mean? You're not permitted to question it, its veracity. Meaning, if you're not able to come to say that's the case, other things were able to come upon its truths if you have the capacity. This we're not able to. So you'd say, well, if it's beyond our reach, but don't we understand if God transmitted it to us and commanded us and presented it to us no different than anything else evidently there is a rationale we find by the Akedah first Hashem says to Avram you will have a son who is beloved to you so and so he will be the equivalent of the stars of the heaven he's the future of existence then Hashem says to Avram bring him up as a burnt offering the two statements are not reconcilable impossible if he's the future, how could I bring him as a sacrifice? And if he's a sacrifice, evidently he's not the future. But Avram knew clearly, Chas v'sholem, God doesn't renege on originally what he had said. How do you reconcile it? It's not reconcilable, humanly. I submit, I accept, I don't question. And that was the test of the Akedah. The test of the Akedah was not, will he slaughter his son or not? question he would slaughter his son. If he threw him, went into, he was agreed to be thrown into the kiln, not to bow to the idol. If, and, and God communicated with him, he's not gonna he's not gonna sacrifice his son where he <laughs> understands God is the one who's communicating to him. So what was the test? The test was not to question God. I submit, total submission. This is the Paraduma. And God afterwards he did reconcile it. Did reconcile it. 
What did he say to Midrash? He said to Avram, although the way you understood it, I said, bring him up as a burnt offering. I said, haleu, bring him up, put him on the altar, bound. I never said, shachteu. I never said, you should slaughter him. Haleu, v'torideu, bring him up and take him down. But the way God wanted him to understand it, it's not reconcilable. It's only after God elucidated what he had said. I never said slaughter, then there's no contradiction. But unless God elucidates it, the things, so how, do you, how do you deal with it? It's my decree. Of course there's a rationale. But we only appreciate its rationale, its inner workings if God reveals it. All the commentators say, Moshe Rabbeinu understood the inner workings. Why did he understand? Although it's the ultimate statute, which humanly, even Shlomo Melech, the wisest man ever to live, endowed with a level of wisdom, which we will discuss, it's not to be comprehended, not to be fathomed. He was not able to fathom the Paraduma. Based on the verse, when Shlomo was endowed with wisdom, his wisdom was greater than Moshe's wisdom. He had greater wisdom, but Moshe understood it, and Shlomo didn't. Why did Moshe understand it? Because God communicated, transmitted the understanding to him. But without that, it would have been impossible. Because based just on your dimension of breadth of and depth of understanding, that's not sufficient. It has to be divinely transmitted. If not, one doesn't have it. So it is difficulty. There's a midrash. The midrash here brings, cites four examples of other statutes. Now, why do the nations do a ridicule us on Paraduma. Now, we have, there are other cases of statutes. What about uh, dietary laws? The Jew has to keep dietary laws. So if a species has two signs, if you choose its cut, it has split hooves, it's kosher species. If not, you're not permitted to eat it. Chuki, Mufanai, the statutes. Many, there are many statutes in, in the Torah. Yet, we're not ridiculed for these statutes. But yet, the Paraduma, we are ridiculed. So why we ridiculed? Because the statute itself is a contradictory statute. It's metame satorim. Those who engage in it become contaminated. The one who slaughters it, the one who burns it, the one whatever it may be, from burning from burning onward, gathering its ash, they're all contaminated. But yet the one who's contaminated, where every other level of contamination, if one immerses himself in the mikvah or into a natural body of water, He's relieved of the contamination. Contamination of the dead, the only process which could release that contamination and remove it is only the paraduma, the red heifer. It's metame esatahorin. Those who are totally pure are contaminated, and the one who's contaminated at the most extreme level, it purifies him. Does it contaminate? Does it purify? It's a little bit of an enigma. The other we ridicule. As they say, it doesn't make sense. It seems the whole thing is absurd. It's either A or B, it can't be both. But we find other things similar to this. For instance, we find that, as we'll see in the in a moment, the Torah tells us that one of the incestuous relationships which a Jew is not permitted to marry is the, bro the wife of one's brother. Torah says that if a man's the wife of one's brother, when is that? If she's divorced or she's widowed <laughs> and she has children from him, or he has children. He did not die childless. His wife is forbidden to marry the brother. That's incestuous relation. What happens if the brother died childless? He, she may have children from other people at prior marriage, but he died childless. The woman who's normally considered forbidden to the brother, there's an obligation for the brother to perform levered marriage. What we call Yibum. How's it possible? It's contradictory. Here, initially, if he would marry her, if she's widowed or divorced, the union has liability, of course, spiritual excision. If there's a child conceived, the child is illegitimate mamzer. But yet, if the brother dies childless, not only is it permitted, it's obligatory, and the child is a, is a kosher Jew. 
if the, the nature of the union is causes spiritual dis destruction, it's lethal spiritually speaking. How, why, if the man dies childless, why is it enhancing and advancing regarding the spiritual standing of a person? It's either A or B. Is it lethal or is it a life potion? It's interesting. You find something similar. So it's contradictory. It's a hoax. It's a hoax. The Gemara tells us in Tainus that Torah says, If a person studies Torah, it's a tree of life. But yet, Torah tells us, we know that Torah is compared to water. So a person studies Torah, just as water sustains the physicality of human being, it's a source of life. Torah is a source of life. Water is, is, is crucial for one's life. Torah is crucial. Yarov Kamoto Likri. Moshe Rabbeinu says before he passes away, he will break you. Kamoto Likri. The Torah will decapitate you. Tizal Katalim Rossi. It will flow like dew. So the question is is it Eitzchamin Lamarzikimbo? Is it a life potion? Or is it a death sentence? It's equivalent to decapitation. The same Torah you study. It could either decapitate you, destroy you, or could advance you at a level where there's nothing comparable to it. Talmud Torah can get cool What is it? So the Gemara says that if a per person studies Torah Lishmo, you study the Torah with the, with the proper intent, it's a life potion. It's Samad It's a life potion. If one studies it Shlo Lishmo, meaning, as the commentators explain, you study with a sinister intent, use it as a destructive tool, it will destroy you spiritually. So, but it's the same Torah. You, you're trying to comprehend and process the same words, the same knowledge. It depends why you're approaching it. If you approach it with the proper intent, it enhances you, you thrive. With the negative intent, it destroys you. Is Torah destructive or is it an enhancement? So you find this du duality regarding Torah, negative and positive, both on the most extreme level. You find by the, uh, if a woman is a suspected adulteress, she was forewarned by her husband not to sequester herself, to seclude herself with another man, and she defies his warning, and she goes into a secluded location for a period of time where they could have cohabited, and she becomes, she's not permitted, she's not permitted to her husband, she's permitted but there's only way, one way that she could be permitted. She has to undergo the process of the Mesota. If the husband is agreeable and he's interested in, in verifying what happened, he takes the Kohen and there's a procedure. The writ of the Sota is written on a piece of parchment. It's obliterated into the water. Many other aspects, details. And then she's given the water to drink. And she's adjured by the Kohen that if she committed adultery and she accepts the oath, she will die the most gruesome, terrible type of death. She will swell, literally, to the point where she will burst and she'll become dismembered. But if in fact she did not commit adultery, then her health will be enhanced. Even if she couldn't conceive, she will be able to conceive. Even if she had children who were not beautiful, the children will have the opposite effect, everything positive. Because she'll be confirmed <laughs> that she's innocent. She did not commit adultery. The water, it's the same water, it's the same writ. God's name is obliterated into the water. Guilty, it's the death sentence. Innocent, not only don't you die, you thrive. The same thing, the Torah. You study it with the proper <laughs> intent, it's a level of enhancement, nothing's comparable to it. You advance your spirituality at a level that it's not to be understood. But yet, if you use it with the sin, you study it with the sinister intent, lakater, samad achay, samad musa, it's a death, it's a death potion, it's a decapit, it's equivalent of decapitation, yarav kamoto lichi. They say, you know, you should be ridiculed. It doesn't make any sense. Is it A or is it B? Is it an enhancement, or is it something which is destructive? 
Is the woman permitted? She not permitted. That's the chok aspect. It's a statute. We have another one. The Torah says a combination of wool and linen, Jews not permitted to wear. wear. It's called, it's referred to as shatnis. But yet the Torah tells us that if you have a four-cornered co- linen garment, you must put tzitzis with tcheles, dyed with the special kind of dye, on its corners. Although, and what is tzitzis? You only apply tcheles to wool. It cannot be applied to linen threads. So here you take wool threads, tying them into the corners of the linen garment, you're creating a combination of what? Of wool and linen. And yet this is a mitzvah. Contradictory. Is it? If shabbos innately is something which is spiritual lethal, how does the Torah permit this? Not only is that lethal, it's shokol kenegot kol mitzvahs. It's the equivalent of performing all the mitzvahs, the all tayag mitzvahs, 613 mitzvahs. Again, a contradiction. The Torah tells us that a woman who's a menstruant, what we call Nido, <coughs> is not permitted to her husband. And it carries a very serious liability. <coughs> Kores, spiritual excision. But yet the Torah tells us if a woman gives birth to a male, she's contaminated for seven days. After seven days, although she continues to menstruate, this is on a Torah level, and she goes to the mikvah and she immerses herself. For 33 days following that seven-day period, she's permitted to husband. If it's a female, she, he's, she's contaminated for two weeks. And if she goes to the mikvah, she immerses herself in the ritual pool or in the, a natural body of water, she's permitted to husband for 66 days, although she's menstruating. It's the same menstrual blood. Yet, it's contradictory. Is menstrual blood something which is not permitted to the point where it carries the liability of Kharis, of spiritual excision. And yet here, it's totally permitted. The woman, the wife, is permitted to her husband. So is it permitted or is forbidden? It can't be both, but it is both. Why? It's a chok. We're ridiculed. But somehow, although we're ridiculed on these various situations, <coughs> But somehow God doesn't say, have to say Chukihit Milufanai Zeri Milufanai It's my decree You find things that are contradictory Why isn't we, ne- we need that bolstering We need that understanding Zeri You're not permitted to question it It has a rationale I didn't share with it here So why by the, regarding the Paraduma we need that special bolstering encouragement, understanding by the others, we don't need that special understanding. I'll give you an example. A person begins studying the Talmud, the Mara. And very often a student, before he's adept in studying and analysis, and before he has a knowledge base, and the teacher teaches, he's confounded by the Gemara. But he's very intelligent. And he's very developed in other areas of intellect. He has a PhD from MIT in astrophysics. So he says to the Rebbe, says to the teacher, Rabbi, the Talmud doesn't make sense. <laughs> it makes sense. You don't understand. It makes sense. So once the, ra- ra- the teacher is able to establish his credibility and he shows him that it does make sense, now he's confronted with another situation. He doesn't say to the teacher, to the Rebbe, I don't understand, therefore it doesn't make sense. He understands. He doesn't understand because he, he doesn't understand yet. And the many things he doesn't understand. It makes sense, but you don't understand. <coughs> Although we find by the other statutes, the contradictions, a mixture of woolen linen is not permitted. It's contra- yet, if you have the four-cornered garment made of linen, and you, you put woolen tzitzis, which is a mitzvah, it's permitted. Not only is it permitted, it advances your spirituality. Shokul connected kol mitzvahs. That statute is understandable. You may not be at the level to be privy to the understanding of that statute. Shlomo Melch says, Achakmo, I became wise. There's nothing I don't understand. Every statute I understand. 
it's, it's within the realm of understanding. But if you don't have the capacity to understand, it's not that it's not understandable. It is understandable. You just don't have the capacity. But if we, we approach the Paraduma, the red heifer, with Shlomo, the wisest man who says, he doesn't understand, what does that mean? It means it's not understandable. So if we approach it and we delve, regardless of our dimension of genius, it's evidently we're ridiculed. You can't even approach it. No, it's beyond human, it's outside of the human realm. It's beyond the human realm. That's why it's not approachable. Of course it has a rationale. It doesn't mean to say there is no rationale. Of course it has a rationale. So therefore, the others that the nations ridicule us, we totally ignore them. It's irrelevant. We don't understand you Jews. The majority of the world don't believe in what you believe in. So why do you believe in what you believe in? You Jews have been, throughout the ages, have been put to death because you're not willing to abandon your religion. It doesn't make sense. You're ignoring all the opportunities of existence, of life. If you would understand, then you would understand. But you don't understand. But it's irrelevant that you don't understand. We don't have to explain it to the world as long as we understand. We understand there is a rationale and it could be understood and it's only, it's our shortcoming. That's what we, we don't understand. Paraduma could not be understood. This is the statute. Even Shlomo Mel, King Solomon's not able to comprehend it. So, is what to ridicule? So what's the point? It's my decree. You have no right to question it. it it's, it's a closed book. It's sealed. You cannot go beyond that. It's interesting. We read in Kikiovos. It says, what is Torah? Hafach bo, hafach bo, the kula bo. As much as you turn the Torah, you delve in the Torah, everything exists within the Torah. There's nothing that doesn't exist within the Torah. Chazal tell us, the Midrash tells us, what, it, what was the blueprint for existence? The blueprint was for existence of the Torah. God looked into the Torah and he created the world. There's nothing in existence which exists which is superfluous because anything that exists, existence, is because it's necessary for the fulfillment of the Torah. Even evil, which is a context of existence, although it's a vacuum, it exists, so once, when he has a choice, he chooses not to partake of that, not to cross the line. So everything, without free choice, there's no, there's no purpose in existence. So if there's a choice, there has to be an alternative. So God has to create both situations, the positive and negative, there should be an alternative. Now it's up to man to make the choice. But there's everything in existence is necessary to address the objective which we call, this is the prosdor. This is the pass-through. This is the, pr the prosdor, this is the pass-through before we come to the ante-room. Before we come to the banquet hall. This world is only the pass-through to come to the world to come. If you succeed in this world, then the, you, you arrive. If God forbid you fail, then you don't arrive. But we say the Chavzayim explains it with a phenomenal, phenomenal allegory. Was this person, he had an unusual type, type of piece of property, was shaped awkwardly. And um, he wanted to do something with the property and he wanted to build a hotel. <coughs> so he gets one of the best architects to design a hotel. And he designs a hotel where the way it's built, it, could, it, will, be the, it will have the most ornate lobby that there's no hotel in the world which will have a lobby like this lobby. But because of the hind part, part of the property, the hallways are going to be able to be more, but the rooms are going to be small rooms. That's the only way it can be designed. The man says, look, I have no choice. He agreed to the design. They built the hotel. So a couple of time points out in Europe, any Jewish hotel keeper poor people, they have nothing. And God forbid if a poor person would have to sleep in the cold, exposed to the elements in a Russian winter, he would die. So they had pity on the poor people. 
and they would allow them to sleep in the hallways of the hotels and they pay a few kopecks. They wouldn't ch barely charge them anything. And the patrons, which that was the money, they would have the hotel rooms. Okay? So where was the money? You build a hotel to make money. As we say, you're in business to make money. If you're not making money, there's no point in being in business. So what happens? So he builds this hotel. The rooms are literally cubicles in the back rooms. And he invites a fellow hotel keeper to see his hotel. He walks into the lobby. He's dazzled. He's never seen anything like it. And he's almost to the point of envy. His hotel doesn't pales compared to this hotel. So he says, let's see the back. Let's, let's go to, to the rooms. Walks down corridors, sizable, nice sized corridors. And then he brings him to the rooms. If you're claustrophobic, you can't stay in the room. Ceiling's nearly on your head, barely room to move. And he says to the man, I don't understand you. You're an intelligent man. How do you invest your efforts and your time and your money in something which is not going to produce any money? You didn't build a hotel so poor people should sleep in the hallways. Right? That's what we call chesed. But you're not building a hotel to do chesed. You're building a hotel to make money. So the Chofetz Chaim says, God created the world. This is the pass-through. It's only a pass-through to arrive in the world to come. So what do we do? A person comes into this world. He has to attend to all his physical needs. Everything is the physical perspective. <coughs> material advancement. Unlimited material. What about the spirituality? Well, you know, that way you can put it in the matchbox which you keep in your coin pocket, in your watch pocket. You know, that's what it is. It, yeah, the, it, the world is only a corridor. Its value is only a pass-through. So what are you investing every aspect of your mind and your ability and time in the corridor? The corridor is only to arrive at the destination. There's no destination here. As we say, you have it backwards. That's what it is. There's no aspect in existence that was created which is not specifically to address one's spirituality to make a, to make a choice. Everything's there. It's Takabar Rais of Abari Alma. And everything's a test. But through Torah, if you apply yourself sufficiently, you're able to come upon its truth. And even if you don't, the Torah is credible. You understand the shortcomings in yourself. It's you don't understand. But if Shlomo Elf doesn't understand, Rechokimi many, it's something which is not comprehensible. So really, you'd say, if King Solomon is not able to figure it out, evidently, what's its value? It's my decree. You have no right even to question it. That's what it's about. So therefore, we may be ridiculed in all the other areas where they're contradictory. We're ridiculed, but it's irrelevant. Because we are have an understanding, and it is something which is understandable, except we don't understand. But paradum is not understandable. It's not, it's not fathomable. So maybe they will have a little bit of a problem. This is the ultimate chok of the Torah. It's interesting, you find famous dialogue between Rabbi Akiva and Tovus Tropus, who was the Roman governor who ultimately put Rabbi Akiva to death. And they were entering into debates very often. So there's a famous midrash where he had asked Rabbi Akiva, who would always enter into public debates with him, whose accomplishment is more perfect, God's or man's? That's what this Roman, heathen pagan, asked Rabbi Akiva. So he said to him, man's accomplishment Take it back. I mean, he's a rabbi, the great rabbi. You're talking chas v'sholem like 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 a heathen. So he says, "How can you say that? Could man create heaven? Could man create earth?" So Rabbi Kiva says, "Boss, I'm not talking about something which is beyond man's ability, but something that's within man's ability. The end product of the human being is is more perfect than God's end product." So he says, "I'll give you an example. You take a kernel of wheat." You plant a kernel, the stalk grows out of the ground. It has to be harvested. It has to be threshed. It has to be winnowed. 
It has to be milled. Then it's made into, into dough. Then take the kernel, take the baked loaf of bread, which is more perfect. Definitely. The loaf of bread is more perfect than the kernel. So it's true, he says, but I have a question I want to ask you. If God created the human being uncircumcised, what do you mutilate the person? It's mutilation. If a male is meant to have a foreskin, what do you remove the foreskin? So Rekiva says that, but you don't understand what I'm talking about. God created an imperfect world. The objective of the human being is to perfect his world. The, imp the imperfection, the blemish is the foreskin. We perfect ourselves by removing that. That's what Rebbe said to him. But if you, uh, you look at the world within a physical context, that's called mutilation. But if you look, understand it within the spiritual context, that that's an impediment to spirituality because that's only an expression of the evil of the Eitz Adas, then you understand that it has to be removed. It's like a person nobody ever saw. He lives in a community. Everybody has, God forbid, a tumor. And it protrudes from a person's cheek. And a person doesn't have it. He comes and visits that community. He says, this man has an abnormality. Every one of the community has this bulge coming out of his cheek or out of his forehead. This man doesn't have it. So what they, the abnormality to them is normal. But it's all abnormality. It's the same thing. You're not supposed to, a human being is not supposed to have the foreskin. The foreskin only was a consequence of the evil of the Eitz Adas, of the tree of knowledge. God says, because you're my people, you have to remove that. And that perfects you to have a capacity for spirituality. That's the whole understanding. Avraham Avinu, originally it says, when he was told to circumcise himself, at the age of 99, he had three compatriots. And he consulted with each one of them to see exactly where they stand. Not that it was a question, not that it was a question that he wouldn't go to, he wouldn't do it. That wasn't the person consulting him. So he consults with one of them, and they say, you know something, I don't think it's a good idea. Why? Because he just defeated the four kings. And you realize, after you circumcise himself, you could be infirm. So the families of the people who you killed, they're going to want to seek out revenge, and you can be vulnerable, and they'll come and they'll kill you. Therefore, I don't think you should circumcise yourself. Here's the other one. One more says, you have a foreskin, what's the point? What's the world going to say? You want to be a model to the world. How are you supposed to conduct yourself like a rational human being? You mutilate yourself. You're acting irrationally. Therefore, my advice to you is don't circumcise yourself. <coughs> Finally comes to Eshkol. Eshkol says to him, what's the problem? I don't have a problem. God says, of course you circumcise yourself. What's the question? You do it. All things. It's relevant the world thinks. God says, you do it, you circumcise yourself. They ridicule us. It doesn't make sense. If we understand it's irrelevant, what you don't understand. What you don't understand to us is irrelevant. As long as we understand. As long as we can put it in a context, it's not a problem. But even if we can't put it in a context, so is it for Aduma, it's not a problem. You're not permitted to even question it. Because again, the Rechaim Akash writes, it's referred to Chuksa Torah, which we'll discuss in a moment. I mean, we're speaking about a statute which relates to the purification of the Jew. That it becomes contaminated with the dead. How does it, how do you bring about the purification? The red heifer, how it has to be processed, how it has to be administered, administrated, and so on and so forth. But see, he asks a question. He says, Zosi chukas hatuma. This is the statute of contamination. Or Zosi chukas hatara. It's the statute of purification, spiritual purification. What does it say? He so explains, he says something interesting. He says it's based on an illusionary interpretation. 
with derech remez yirtzeh ba'omro chukas haTorah shim yikaimu mitzvah zo. If you're able to fulfill this mitzvah as it should be fulfilled, hagam hayosah chukah b'lotam. Although it's something which is not comprehensible, it's not fathomable. Is it? Malay leim akoski l'kima Torah. God says, I value it, even though you don't understand it, as if you fulfilled the Torah. Why? A person who fulfills the mitzvah, although he doesn't understand, based just on trust, on blind faith in God, this establishes the righteousness of his belief. This establishes a person, he says, God to me is credible. Whatever he tells me to do, whatever test I'm presented with, it will, it will not faze me. As he fulfills this, although it's not fathomable, you can't even approach it, and he embraces it, what is his mindset? Whatever God wants, I'm here to do your will. So, therefore, it's the equivalent of establishing, accepting the whole Torah its entirety. And this is the confirmation. Therefore, God wants to have this one mitzvah. I mean, God could have explained it to us. As he explained it to Moshe. But he told Moshe, I don't want you to transmit it. Although Moshe had the understanding, it had to remain a secret. He couldn't communicate it. The rationale of it. So he says, maybe the reason is because this is to establish the credibility of the Jew in terms of his trust and faith in God, that if he does this, his, what's, his, what's his declaration? Regardless, I, I, and this is what's the whole idea of, of dying al Kiddush Hashem, a person has his whole life before him. He's able to accomplish so much. God's person is confronted with a situation. He has to give his life. Does a person question, what about my family? What about my future? What about my potential? What about all the Kiddush Hashem that I'm able to bring about in existence? It's not a question. God says you're supposed to die. That, that's what it is. That's a demonstration of that level of faith. Unquestioning. You don't question. Especially we're talking about a case where you have an alternative. It's not where a situation person had no choice but to be killed because he's a Jew. You had a choice. If you would have crossed the line, they would let you live. God says, don't cross the line, I don't cross the line. But do you realize what you're giving up? It's irrelevant. God says, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm agreeable to do it. So again, that's a declaration and a demonstration of one's belief of faith in God, regardless of whether I am or not. It's equivalent to the Akeda. Avram says, you tell me one thing, they're not reconcilable. It's irrelevant. I do it because that's what you asked me to do. God doesn't renege on his word. I don't understand. It's irrelevant what I understand. I don't understand. <coughs> Let's try to understand when it says that Shlomel was Chochmi Kolodom. To what degree was the who ever lived? There's a verse at Goelis. Ko zo nisisi b'chokma. All this I tested with my wisdom. Amarti echkama. I said I'd become wise. Be rechokim many. But as wise as I am, it's beyond me. That's what Shlomo says. Amarti echkama. What does it mean? I became. I said, because of what I said, I was endowed with wisdom. God gave wisdom to Shlomo. He had a tremendous degree of insight to a great degree and a broadness of heart. The Midrash cites a verse in Malochim, in Kings. 
Shenoslo hachokme b'maton. It was a gift. He was endowed with a gift of wisdom. Shlomo. To what degree was he wise? Kachol al sher al svasayom. It was the equivalent of the sand on the seashore. Shem says to Avraham Avinu, your progeny are going to be like the granules of sand on the seashore. Just as they cannot be counted, your children will not be, your progeny will be able to not be able to count. To what degree was Shlomo's wisdom? It will be the equivalent of that. It's the number of granules of sand. Is it comprehensible? Is it computable? It's not. That is the the degree of wisdom of Shlomo. It's not fathomable. The level of genius. His wisdom was the equivalent of the wisdom of the whole Jewish people combined. Because we find the Jewish people are compared to the sand on the, on the, of the sea. The number of the Jewish people will be like the sand on the sea. What does this mean? The Chachomim, the wise Jews, they have great degrees of discretion and understanding. Hazakanim, elders, Yeshbem Das, they also have a level of understanding. Hayulodim Yeshbem Das, children have a, a degree of understanding, each one from his own vantage point. The one with the great mind sees it one way. The sage sees it another way. Children see it another way. Even a precocious, capable, genius child sees it his way. If you take all Jews combined, put them on one side. And Shlomo would be on the other side. His wisdom is greater than all of theirs combined. Now, what, what level of wisdom is this? This is called Asher Layam. Them. So Shlomo HaMelech's wisdom is not fathomable. It's a genius. We can't fathom this genius. And despite that, he could not come about upon the truth of Paraduma, the red heifer. Achakmo. I was endowed with wisdom. At what dimension? Relatively speaking, infinite wisdom. Relatively speaking. And with, even though relative, it's infinite... I could not understand the statute of the Paraduma. Why? So first of all, what does it say about the Paraduma? The level, you need infinite wisdom. Shlomo's with wisdom is relative, relatively infinite. But to understand Paraduma, it's truly, you need infinite wisdom. Only God knows. God himself is, wis is infinite. Now let's understand. So there's a phenomenal Orachim which I mentioned a number of years ago. Going back on the question. Zos chukas ha Torah. Why is the ritual of the Paradum, the red heifer, which is a statute referred to as the statute of the Torah. Let it be referred to as Zos chukas ha Tuma, the statute of spiritual contamination. Zos chukas ha Tarum. As he explains, before Sinai, before we left Egypt, we were involved in the Korban Pesach. We had to bring the Paschal Lamb. And the Torah speaks about the laws which pertain to that. It cannot be blemished, and so on and so forth. It must be eaten as one family. But the laws of spiritual purity are not mentioned. Although the Jews were exposed to all levels of contamination, even the contamination of the dead, yet they were qualified to slaughter and tea to partake of the Korban Pesach, of the Paschal Lamb. Why? So he explains, because pre-Sinai, what was our status? We were Noah. We were Noahites. A non, just as an animal, is not susceptible even to the most extreme level of contamination. We being B'nai Noah, Noahites, as the non-Jew was not susceptible, we weren't susceptible. Therefore, the laws of spiritual impurity had no relevance to us before Sinai. We come to Sinai, it's a whole different, we become the Am Kodosh. We become the Am Hashem. We become the Mamlechas Kohanim. We become the Goy Kodesh with the holy people. What happens at Sinai? We're given the Torah. 
the way we became God's people is we accept, we received this Torah. What happened when we received the Torah? Now, what I'm telling you now is an <coughs> embellishment to understand the Rechaim HaKodesh. The Ramam writes that there were three crowns given to the Jewish people. We have Keser, we have Keser Kuna, we have the crown of Kuna priesthood that was given Aaron the Bono, to Aaron and his children, with Keser Malchus, the crown of royalty that was given to David Lazaro, to King David and his progeny, and we have Keser Torah, which is given to every Jew. Munachas Bezovis is lying in a corner, and it's for every Jew to partake of. How do we know this? Because it's a puzzle. It says, Torah Tzivilon and Moshe, Morosho Kilas Yaakov. It's the Morosho, it's the heritage of every Jew, of the congregation of Yaakov. And then the Ramam writes, based on the mission of Pirkei Ovos, and which crown is the greatest crown? The crown of Torah is the greatest. Because kings are coronated with the crown of Torah. So it surpasses the crown of kingship and the crown of Kuna, a priesthood. So I ask the question. If a commoner puts on a crown, <coughs> what does that say? Does that say he's royalty? He's a, a commoner wearing a crown. If a non kohen puts on the, the priestly vestments, he's a commoner wearing <coughs> priestly vestments. What does the crown reveal? If a person's a kohen, a kohen who officiates without wearing the priestly vestments, the big day kuna, he's, he's not qualified to officiate. So he only is an effective kohen if he officiates with the proper vestments. The crown that the king wears, if you're from Zereshel David, you're from the progeny of the Davidic line, the crown establishes you, identifies you as you're the king. But if you're not from the Davidic line, it doesn't mean anything. It's a charade. Before a Jew studies Torah, he doesn't have the crown of Torah. We're, we're talking Keser Torah. And the Rambam writes how one acquires the crown of Torah. It's a le level of dedication to Torah, unswerving dedication. That's the primary focus in the person's life. He doesn't waste a moment. He's fully invested. And only then do you acquire the crown of Torah. So before you study Torah, you have no relevance to Torah. After you study Torah, how, is, how, does, the, how does it come about? You're still the same person putting a, wearing a crown. If you had it before, so then you don't have to apply yourself. And if you didn't have it, how does this bring about this, the crown of Torah? So you see from the Rambam, which is based on the Mishnah, that when a Jew studies Torah, every Jew has a spiritual potential, which has to do with his his spiritual makeup of his Jewish soul. Now, if you want to activate that spirituality, as we see Talmud Torah connected to Kulam, it activates it to the equivalent that a metamorphosis takes place. You become a different dimension of person. You're no longer the same person as before. It's not your repository of information. Before you were devoid of information, now you, you have information. You have Torah knowledge. You're not just a repository of information. When you study Torah, it activates your soul, the spirituality, the neshama. You become a different being. You become a different entity of, 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 of spirituality. This is Keser Torah. When Hashem, God, gave us the Torah at Sinai, we were not susceptible to contamination. We were intellectual animals, relatively speaking. An animal is not susceptible to even the most extreme level of contamination. We were not susceptible. What happened at Sinai? We accepted the Torah. We have relevance to what? To the infinite. If you're God's people, you become part of you. You have relevance to the infinite. God is infinite. And you're Goy Kodosh because God is associated with you. Because Kedusha is relevant to wherever God is. God is associated with us. That means we have relevance to the infinite. We only have relevance to the infinite because we have a potential to engage in the infinite. What's the infinite? The infinite is Torah. Torah being God's wisdom, that is the infinite. Now, a Jew representing the infinite, everything that exists in, in creation has to be sustained by God. Otherwise, it doesn't exist. We speak about the nether forces in, 
in existence which represent all what's contaminated in the world, they also have to be sustained. A Jew being a bastion of holiness because of his relationship with the infinite, because what was infused in his neshama, potentially, at Sinai, we became different, different dimension of person. We say, Yeshin is Gary Kotchenola Domi. A convert who converts to be a Jew, he's like a newborn child. He's no longer the same person as, as prior to conversion. At Sinai, we became different beings. We are no longer the same being as prior previously. In what way did we become different beings? Before we were finite. We, all, we were limited to the finite. Afterwards, we, we have relevance to the infinite. Why? Because when we said Nasev and Nishma at Sinai, and we accepted the Torah unconditionally at Sinai, we were able to make that connection. The God, through the Torah, the Torah being God's wisdom. As a result of this, so again, why does the Jew have relevance to the most intense level of spirituality, which cannot be released unless you undergo the Paraduma process? Because since the Jew has that representation of the godliness of the infinite, therefore all these nether forces attach themselves to him. He's not an intellectual animal. He's the source of spirituality. Therefore, he contracts contamination at many levels. He touches a rodent, it's one level. He has a discharge, a certain it's another level of contamination. You engage with the dead, it's the most extreme level of contamination. That contamination, by divine dictate, can only be released with the process of the paradum and the red heifer. It cannot be released any other way. Zos Chukas Torah. It's the statute of the Torah because of your connection to Torah. That's why you are susceptible and you can contract this level of contamination. So what is the level of contamination? What is it based upon? That we ourselves, we have relevance to the infinite. What do we have relevance to the infinite? Because Torah is God's wisdom. Not relatively infinite, it is infinite. It's God's wisdom. So if the Jew himself, the base of the contamination is the Torah itself, and the Torah itself is infinite, whatever Solomon's, King Shlomo Melech's wisdom was, he could be kechol ayom. Relatively speaking, it's infinite. But in the absolute sense, it's not infinite. Torah in the absolute sense is, is infinite. Because it's God's wisdom. If that is the case, even Shlomo Melech cannot comprehend the Torah the laws of spiritual contamination of the dead. Of course, that's directly entwined and rooted in what Torah is. If you understand the extent, the depths and the breadth of Torah in its totality, then you understand why the Jew himself, when he contracts this level of contamination, he's not able to release it unless he undergoes this process. But who understands that? Only God himself. <laughs> Because God is infinite, this is an infinite. You have to understand, be infinite to understand infinite. Is whatever King Solomon was, although he was the equivalent of the whole Jewish people in wisdom, <coughs> but that's still finite. Therefore, he cannot come upon that. This is the understanding. With this, we're able to understand. We say that Kol Yisrael Yeshlem Chedem Elamabo Every Jew has a share in the world to come. What is the world to come? The world to come is a relationship with God. A non-Jew does, does not have a share in the world to come. Does not. If a person is from Hasidus or Umas Olam, he's from the righteous Gentiles of the world, he has relevance to that, but it's not the same level as a Jew. Why? He, he's a do-gooder. He did his thing. Only the Jew in Yesh Lochev Olam Abo. Olam Abo is you're able to attach to the infinite. Who can attach to the infinite? If you have relevance to the infinite. The Torah, because we accept the Torah at Sinai, what happened to our souls? Every person's neshama became, has relevance to the infinite. Because if you accepted Torah, which is God's wisdom and God's prescription of life, which indicates the dimension of your spirituality, and it impacted to that degree. Who are you? You have relevance to the infinite. 
Therefore, you could cleave to the infinite. Only the Jew could cleave to God. The non-Jew cannot cleave to God. Why? Because the Jew has no relevance to the infinite. He's finite. Therefore, only the Jew could have relevance to the world to come. Of course, the world to come is a relation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, As it says, Tzadikim Yoshim Vichrasem B'Rashayim That Tzadikim sit with their crowns on their heads V'nenim Ziv Ashkino And they bask in the radiance of, of the Divine Presence That's only the Jew Has no relevance to the non-Jew Because only the Jew is that And this is Yisrael V'Raisa V'Kuchim V'Chul Chadu It's Yisrael V'Raisa That's the word It's not Yisrael V'Kuchim V'Chul V'Torah Yisrael V'Raisa The Jew in conjunction with Torah, because we accepted Torah, what does that say? Who are we? We have re- we embrace the Torah. What is Torah? That's God's wisdom. That's infinite. Therefore, Kuchibrichu, Chatu. Therefore, all one and the same. We're intertwined. We cannot. We're not separated. Mora tells us that if a non-Jew studies Torah, he deserves to be put to death. Why does he deserve? Because it says, "Bo Rosha Kilas Yaakov." It is the heritage of the congregation of Yaakov. We know in Hebrew, the shin and the sin are interchangeable because it's just where you put the dot. If the dot's on one side, it's pronounced as a shin, s h. Otherwise, it's a sin. Now, what does it mean in Bo Rosha? Muresis. She is the betrothed. The tr- Torah is the betrothed of the, the congregation of Yaakov. God forbid a man takes a woman who's married to another person. If the betrothal is adultery, the non-Jew is not permitted to partake of that. If he partakes of that, it's the equivalent of adultery. Why? The man wants to expand his horizons of religions, of wisdom. And he wants to study the authentic text, a text of truth. Unless he has an interest to convert, he's not permitted. And even when he studies it, it's only to the extent <laughs> what's necessary for conversion. Beyond that per- point, he's not permitted to study it. Why? What is Torah? Torah is the infinite. Could you imagine? You have an electrical, electrical component, and it says maximum 100 volts. And you put in about 3 trillion volts. What happens to it? It doesn't exist. <laughs> the Torah is the infinite wisdom of God. The Jew has an infinite capacity. Capacity, of course, we could cleave to Hashem. Only the Jews the vacant Hashem kuchem kuchem. The non-Jew is finite. If that's the case, it's something which is exclusive to the Jew. The non-Jew has no relevance to it. So what's the consequence of that? It's a spiritual demise. That's that's the consequence of this. It's interesting. The Gemara tells us, according to one opinion. Sanhedrin, Akum Shishavas Chayv Misa. A non Jew who observes the Shabbos, he deserves to be put to death. Deserves to be put to death. He's not permitted to observe the Shabbos. So if even, even a person, before he converts to be a Jew, even an authentic conversion, he has to, he cannot keep the Shabbos in its entirety until he converts. So even if he keeps everything, one thing, he has to violate the Shabbos. The question is why? What is Shabbos? Shabbos is made on the Mabo. The spirituality of Shabbos is rooted in what? God's presence enters into this existence. That's, it's a semblance of the world to come. Only if you observe the Shabbos do you have a semblance to that Shekhinah. If a Jew doesn't observe the Shabbos, he has no relevance to that relationship. A Jew who truly observes the Shabbos properly he has relevance to that relationship. So what happens if a non-Jew observes that? It's like a non-Jew studies Torah he deserves to be put to death. It's the same thing. Because what do you want to cleave to? You're finite. How does something finite cleave to something which is infinite? You don't have the capacity. Therefore, you die. 